will be mostly in English. For whatever is in French, I'll just venture to translate or be summarized and, and etc. Thank you everyone for being here uh, today. We are part of this UN great conference, uh, which we've been badly waiting for the last 46 years. So uh, we're happy it is there finally. We'll see what's the outcome, but here we're happy to co-organize this event with the Initiative for the Future of Great Rivers, Initiative for uh, L'Avenir des Grands Fleuves, represented by Eric, and the Bridge Tank, uh, which is a think tank affiliated to the G20 and G7, uh, which, we, which I represent uh, here. We'll talk for one hour about hydro diplomacy. Uh, hydro diplomacy twisted in a kind of original way. Uh, we believe that, and Eric will tell us that, that war is too serious to be left to army people. Hydro diplomacy is very serious too, and uh, of course it needs diplomats, but it shouldn't be left to diplomats. And all the categories uh, should help and contribute, de-risking, appeasing, and peace is very important in this process to make the recourse, the last, re, last resort recourse to diplomats uh, come in just <clears throat> and very or not come and that we build peace. So peace based on tools, it's what we're going to discuss today. We've uh, worked on this issue in the past. Uh, we've been happy to uh, tour Europe. Uh, we've been happy to do field work in Africa. We have another event on that as a joint endeavor, a joint venture uh, tomorrow. Uh, we've been uh, engaging on this concept of broadened hydro diplomacy in different capitals in Europe. And Madame La Ministre, I was very happy, very lucky to go thrice to Albania uh, last spring. Uh, and I could see in three weeks, in early September, this was like bright summer. In yeah. late September, we were feeling like in autumn already. Yeah. There was droughts in the beginning of September. There was there were heavy rains at the end of September. That's adaptation. That's mm -hmm. climate change. So we're very happy that, that you're here. And we're very happy that you tell us about a unique experience you have in, in, in Albania about the Viosari in a very short while. Before that, Eric, we would want to have you a few words as a co-organizer. We're very proud yeah. and lucky to be working with Marais uh, uh, Rivers, which you represent, in a few words, in the language you want. It can yeah. be Breton. Hein? Yeah. Oui. Oui. Alors, en Albanais, bientôt, je prends des cours. Et ça viendra un peu parce que euh, j'étais ami de beaucoup d'écrivains voilà. Je suis linguiste de profession, donc je pourrais... Euh, ah ben, C'est parfait. parfait, merci beaucoup. Uh, no, we are very happy, very proud to, to co-organize uh, this event. Why, why Great River? Because I used, about uh, 15 years ago, I wrote a book about the future of water. The point is to, to, to make uh, people pay attention to water. Water is of course, very essential, but it's a commodity, the first one of commodity. And the point is to, to, to increase the, the conscience, consciousness of that. We, we thought that it was necessary to, to, to go to a, a, a living a being like river, because uh, you see, as a, a novelist, a river is a character. I prefer to tell the story of a character instead of uh, trying to tell the story of a commodity. That's why, because it's more concrete and it's deep, deep involved in uh, geography. So, so well, in that stage when, when you have some battle between, between nations, that's why. So I'm very happy to, to be here and to give the, the floor to, uh, uh, to uh, my uh, future professor. <laughs> Good evening, thank you very much. I will switch into French, not uh, 
um, because I cannot speak in English, but I have so rarely the, the possibility, the occasion to talk in French that once I can do it, I will do it. So I'm switching into French. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Madame Minister, Madame Fauché. Uh, we have here in the room some people who don't follow French, so I'll translate for them, but they clapped as well because uh, they were listening to you and your uh, speech was inspirational, it was inspired. You talked about soul, nature, and our children, and this is why we're here. Uh, it, it and I can modestly vouch for what Eric Orsena was saying that your French is amazing and excellent. Eric, I believe there are five yeah. seats uh, which are open at the Academy Francaise nowadays. I think yeah. you, you should. Five seats. You so should. if you want one seat, we, uh, I can support you, of course. We should campaign for you. Please do. Let I, I'm very busy with my, my River of Yosa. You know, we have just started the first stage already declared national park uh, just two weeks ago. It was a big ceremony in Albania for this declaration. We have uh, accomplished this first step of the project together with uh, international NGOs, international experts, and uh, with the expert of IUCN, which is International Union for Conservation of Nature. Uh, but also with uh, a great cooperation with Patagonia, which is the American uh, big uh, company who helped us. And uh, now it's uh, the second step. We have already started the negotiation with the Greek uh, government in order to have a transboundary national park between Aos, which is the Greek part of the river, and Viosa, which is the Albanian part side. So it will be not only, we have not only the first national park of a wide river in Europe, but we will have also the first transboundary park with Aos and Viosa. And the, the follow-up, uh, it's another uh, big step, the management plan. So for the moment, the the time is so busy and the ambition also this is why it's maybe better that you come in albania for the for visiting our our river but which is also your river i'm saying this because with unesco we have already started the process or let's say the preparation of the process in order to for the inscription of Yosa River in the reserve biosphere of UNESCO uh, natural uh, heritage list. And, but you have to visit Albania also because we have wonderful landscape, wonderful uh, cultural heritage, archeological sites and amazing food, believe me. Thank you very much. If I trans not translate, I will not do justice to uh, the, 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 the refined arguments, but uh, very briefly, the lady minister uh, mentioned that uh, the fact that she's minister of tourism and environment is not by chance. It's to absolutely reconcile uh, the two and to have a balanced uh, way of approaching not just the river, but today we're interested in, in, in the river. She was also mentioning that Albania is at the same time 100% renewable energy, depending on hydropower. But this depending is sometimes true and accurate. And Albania also depends on the variations of the weather and climate, uh, climate change. And that therefore, there's a sort of dependency to meteorology. But that nonetheless, they've decided to increase the uh, area of protected nature, of, uh, uh, of safeguarding nature that they've just declared two weeks ago and this is why I'm so happy to have you with us the first natural park which is a river natural park in, in Europe which uh, she vouches and the country vouches that it becomes the first transnational river park in the world when uh, hopefully Greece, uh, Greece joins uh, because the river starts in Greece flows through uh, flows through Albania and uh, Eric you were talking about characters and uh, here we have an interesting character it changes its name it's born uh, Ios and then 
he grows up and becomes uh, Kyosa. So over the course of the river, it changes its name. You've had also, Ms. Uh, Mrs. Minister, a very interesting argument on why a, I'm quoting you, small country is investing into preserving uh, uh, its resource while uh, in the last wild river in the world and definitely in Europe, uh, while other so-called bigger countries, again, quoting your words, have no longer have wild rivers and that there should be a moment of re reflection of what happens to other rivers. We have here panelists, some of them are deeply involved in the management of these other rivers. They're also thinking in terms of renaturation and you were thinking about, uh, you were expressing that we are at a moment of thinking we are part of that here with this concept of hydro diplomacy, which involves a new look at the resource. Is it a common good? Is it a public good? Which involves uh, this renewed concept of hydro diplomacy, the use of the involvement of different actors, and which involves also, and you didn't touch that, that's your, uh, that's your uh, genuinity, but uh, this needs funding. So in our conception of renewed hydro diplomacy, once you integrate different people, different actors, different uses, and a care for nature, this needs funding. And we also engage uh, both organizations with the issue of blue bonds uh, and how this efforts, this involving of actors leads to documentation, leads to data, and these data should turn into funding uh, to preservation. One last point I would uh, thank, I would, I would add, you mentioned about the soul. There's this beautiful novel by uh, uh, Romain Gary, uh, uh, Charge d'âme. This is not linked to rivers exactly. This is linked to a kind of fantasized Albania, but nonetheless, it is based in Albania. If any of you who's not read uh, Charge d'âme uh, by uh, Romain Gary, and it's about energy, energy that comes from the soul, which is captured by some mad technologists uh, in the 50s. So thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Minister. Eric, maybe in a few words, then we'll open to, uh, we have a, a large uh, panel. Uh, what's your reaction on that as uh, you've been a writer, you've been a diplomat, uh, you've been a lawyer, working with lawyers. You're a teacher at uh, the School of War. Uh, we're talking about rivers for peace, but you teach at the war school. What's your what's your take on rivers? Well, my first contact to uh, Albania was Ismail Kadare, because we we share the same publisher, and we are good friends. We were good friends, and we talk together quite often. Oh, well, we have a common friend, Miss Erna. Well, we have some links together. Yes, of course. To be precise, but I, I think we will have some more links. Yeah. But unfortunately, time is not to reconciliation. Of course, as you can see all over the planet, you have some tension. I, I'm just coming back from Ukraine. I can tell the situation is quite tough. And uh, my lessons in the War Institute in France is about uh, uh, many regions where you have some conflicts. So far, I mean, till the end of the last century, um, you have quite few uh, conflicts uh, having uh, water as uh, uh, a coach. But now, given the fact that you have demographic pressure, urbanization, and climatic uh, change, you have more and more conflicts having uh, uh, water as a reason. For instance, uh, near uh, near east, of course, uh, Euphrat, uh, the Tigre, of course, then, uh, of course, uh, Israel and Palestine, of course, Nile. And I give uh, five lessons about, about Nile. Uh, the, the conflict between Egypt and uh, Ethiopia is going to be tough and tough with the dam of Renaissance, as you know, but of course with, uh, uh, with uh, Bangladesh 
and, uh, and Mekong and so on and so forth. Uh, first point. Another point is um, we have about uh, 600 million people living in a delta. Each delta is threatened by all the countries uh, up, 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 uh, upstream for, for a lot of reasons, as we know. So if uh, the river giving life to the delta is not considered as a common uh, good, will have some threat to all these people being just under and living in the delta. 600 million people, for instance. We're going in some, uh, some weeks in Bangladesh. Uh, if nothing is changed, about half of the Bangladesh, that means uh, 70 million people will be under the water. So this one is a stake, as you know. Uh, so, uh, so how prevent, how prevent these very new and very active sources of conflict? How could we prevent this new tension? As you know, every, nearly everywhere in the world, you have new tension. But uh, for instance, you have before uh, oil tension, uh, you have coal tension, uh, and, and so on. But now you have water tension. So what is at stake and what is the, the goal of this, this meeting is see, it's to see together how could we prevent these new active sources of conflict. Very briefly, Eric, you're an economist by training. Economists usually are optimists. And the easy solution is we need finance. And now we're talking about blue bonds. Can blue bonds solve that and the risks of war? Alors, je vais parler en français pour être plus précis. C'est que les blue bonds euh, peuvent rien contre la folie des nationalismes. It's about politics. Uh, yes, because uh, that's it. It's back. Politics is back. Nationalism is back. And then, and then uh, blue bonds are not able to give wisdom to, uh, uh, to uh, our uh, humanity. Yeah. But, but we'll beat nationalism with well, good politics. So it's also the return of yes, great politics. Yes, of course. We, we have solution because we have example. And unfortunately, no one is coming from, uh, yeah. from uh, Valley du Senegal, where you have four countries, uh, four countries working together. Uh, uh, and on the basis very clear, of uh, considering uh, the river Senegal as a common good. And I was there during a war, during a war between Mauritania and Senegal. And that was quite a severe war. And what- uh, 1989. Gave, yeah, uh, gave end to this war was not, you know, unfortunately, was not the organization, the, the Unité Africaine, but OMVS. Because they share this common good, they know that without uh, without River Senegal, you have no life possible uh, uh, within this region, and so they stop the war. They stop the war because not because of wisdom, but because of realism. And this, uh, I think, this organization, organization of the Valley du Senegal would deserve a Nobel Prize, Peace Nobel Prize, of course, because this is a fantastic example. So now we know what is the situation and we, we need, we deeply need solution. And it's exactly why we are here. Thank you. Christian, Christian Breton from the Geneva Water Hub. The Geneva Water Hub is no introduction, you're its uh, scientific director. And I think the Geneva Water Hub thinks alike that that river basin organization and maybe other river, uh, that the concept of river basin organizations deserves a Nobel Prize. You might want to get back to that, but I was listening to you carefully this morning in a fantastic session that was organized by the Association of African River Based Organization. And here we're talking about uh, inter, uh, international river-based organizations. 
you were mentioning a few points. Uh, first of all, that we're talking about the common good, while others talk about uh, uh, regional public good. I don't want to be too technical, but tell us what's the right tool uh, for that. Because again, economics are important, the way to fund uh, the transitions are important, and economists and financial markets need to know whether it's a common good and it's public intervention in one way or uh, public good in another way, and etc. You were spoken, speaking this morning about multi-sectoral cooperation, and that is important. What the uh, Minister Fossi and what Eric were mentioning, Israelia relates to the different uses of water. You preserve the water when the balance of uses works, and you were talking about good tools. And one word you had this morning, a fantastic session, once inspired me the long lasting peace. I spent some time in China. In China, the long lasting peace, because it's China, the long, long peace. Okay. What's this long peace and, and what are the tools in the okay. sector? I'll just jump in very quickly. Uh, this minister is, is going to leave us uh, sure. because it's quite late in Tirana. So, uh, <laughs> just, <laughs> yeah. thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. You're muted. Yes, it's already midnight over in Tirana. Yeah, we understand. Thank you. Yeah. I want to thank you very much for this opportunity to exchange together. And don't forget my invitation. We, we will take it short. Sure. Whenever you want. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry for you, but we'll be soon in your country. Sorry for you. <laughs> thank you. Merci beaucoup. Bonne continuation. Merci. Soyez les bienvenus. Merci. 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 Au revoir. Christian, many questions, but yeah, you're the specialist. Uh... Well, maybe I'll start with the last one, the long lasting piece, yes, because please. it echoes a little bit also the, what, what Eric said. And we at the team of water, we see peace as not only as, a, as the absence of conflict. Actually, yep. peace is a lot about prevention and trying to avoid actually the conflict to take place. And what we saw from our experience in Western African countries, notably, but also to echo the, the Senegal case, is that there are many different ways to do those prevention work. So there's certainly this dialogue platform that's there. Uh, also, the need for institutional setup, with this assumption that the more institutions we have, the less chances we have for conflict. But then also this key element of redistribution. And we saw too many times, you know, those dams being yeah. built with electricity line going to the capitals. And then the local population did not get anything out of the infrastructure. And this is exactly what fuels at the end, you know, tensions at the local level, terrorism, uh, violence uh, at the local level. And we need to avoid that, to work on better redistribution of the benefits across the world best. And this is how we, we see prevention on the long term and long lasting peace. So not only acting when the conflict occurs, but trying to anticipate those possible tensions with social economic developments in the regions with the local populations. So that's the first element. Then you, the second question was related to common good versus public good. And well, without going into the lecture on the institutional, new institutional economics, um, indeed, water is a bit tricky because it's a, a little bit, always a bit in between. You have the very nature of the water, which is clearly a common pool resource, and then different ways of managing the resource uh, itself. And the, what the literature shows is that, and what we know is that for a common pool resource such as water, you have actually more risks for overexploitation, strong use rivalries, and possible conflicts. So this is like the tragedy of the commons. A narrative, you know, which has been often used by the literature. But there's also the other narrative, which says that actually the common good is also an opportunity for the stakeholders to get together, to self-organize, to find solutions. Uh, again, looking at what is happening at the local level. And that's, that's quite key, I guess. And this brings me to the last point about intersectoral uh, perspectives. And I think here we have two types of dynamics that have to be considered. The first one, the first sense certainly does let's say, horizontal integration across different sectors that needs to go out of the silos. And this is, again, about managing complex trade-offs and different objectives. So, indeed, the politics is there and has to be managed. But that's a key element. 
But then there's another element that seems really key to me, also linked to my previous points, is the vertical integration. The fact that we need to bridge between the different narratives that take place within the basin. Uh, to give you a simple example, if you go in the, in the Laos, in the Mekong region, you will have the national authorities that will tell you, you know, Mekong is the battery of Southeast Asia. Yeah. Okay. But then when you talk with a the farmer, they have a totally different narrative about what is happening in the region. But those two narratives do not interact at all, which leads to, you know, misunderstanding and again, issues of a recognition and possible tensions. So we need some kind of platform that allow to bridge those different narratives for better adaptive capacities. At the end. Uh, on these platforms, you, the, the tale of two rivers you're telling us, you know, like the tale of two cities, by Dickens, we are under the impression that you, and the more we go in scarcity on competition, a rivalry over the use, we, we have this tale of two rivers. Uh, the tragedy of the commons on the one hand and the well-performing, sustainable uh, organization. What is the determining factor on that? Is it thinkable to have that when you have a region where you have different countries, when you have large powers versus small countries, we're talking about the Mekong, when you have, is it possible when you have powerful countries, but one is upstream and playing the upstream part? Maybe thinking of the nine, we may be thinking of the Brahmaputra as well. No. Uh, or is it only possible when there's a check and balance across countries? And subsequent question is how can platforms help when you're locked regionally? How can international exchange uh, help unlock things in your experience? Well, well, the way you frame the question already shows one of the issues uh, is the fact that it's either really national or local. We, we lose the meso institution part, you know, the, the intermediary platform that are needed. Uh, and this is what, uh, again, to go back to institutional economics, uh, Claude Medal, he always ah. talks about meso institutions. He was my professor. You see? And, um, and we have really good examples. I mean, we, we, we mentioned o OMVS, uh, which is a river basin organization, that are exactly those type of organizations that allows the link between across borders, but also able to trigger this dialogue across different institutional levels. Uh, so we have the tool there. And then nowadays, we also have new type of narratives that are coming with, for instance, the uh, legal personhood of rivers that brings new ways of looking at those discussions with new type of actors that are also more empowered to make their case and to bring the top forward. You're a scientist, you work on tools, and I, I, I recommend everyone to look at the reports of the Cinema Water Hub, even on, on, even on uh, countries where the civil war and etc. For instance, uh, in Mali, Niger, Burkina Faso, this area, you have fantastic data, I'm very impressed with how you did that. So, you, you, the Geneva Water Hub it, is a scientific institute. When you meet the politicians, how can you bring this complexity, this wealth of data, of analysis, of new institutional economics, and etc., in simple words for the politicians to buy the argument and to act and to realize that they ought to be in the right way of the narrative? Difficult question, but yeah. you're, you're based in Geneva. Well, actually, we don't we don't have uh, much hope about being in the position to really change the narrative of the politicians, because their agenda goes usually beyond what we try to do. Uh, but what we try to do is to bridge actually those narratives with other perspectives, trying to work with the actors in the field and to make their case visible. So we, then we try strategically to bring those narratives forward in the right arenas to have an impact. But it's really not about you know, simply bringing the data to the politicians and, and the hoping for change. It's really about trying to connect the issues in a more open so we to your left is a hydro diplomat. You might want to nuance that, and we'll get to that. Uh, uh, we'll get to that to open the politicians and the tools and, and, and politics. We, we'll get to that. We, we'll keep that in mind. But you were mentioning about the local, the international, regional, and 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 well, the meso. Uh, Marie Laure Vercon, had the French partnership. Uh, Wonderful. And I heard you on a fantastic radiophonic uh, uh, a show uh, radio. You mentioned about the uh, 
French school on water, called Française de l'eau, and the great cycle of water and this kind of local short cycle of water. Can you tell us a bit more about that? How this helps hydro diplomacy? Hydro diplomacy is only about big cycle, or can the small cycle the practitioners help avoiding uh, tensions and crisis? I'll reframe a little bit. Um, this is what you already did on the radio. You <laughs> did that to, to, to the Christine of that, so I don't know. Um, so, uh, well, first I'd like to uh, emphasize, I mean, to, to, to thank you for uh, uh, choosing hydro diplomacy as uh, an important, uh, as a focus for your uh, organization and also uh, uh, IFGR, you know, there's, uh, we need more advocates for peace, of course. Um, and uh, and and to to, re to go back to your uh, specific question, so uh, you heard me mention the French school. So the French school uh, was um, sort of born in the '60s, and and yes, it's about the French way to manage. Uh, their water, water resources, but water hydrographic basins. So at the basin level. Um, and they've, you know, uh, it's been thought through by uh, uh, lots of French engineers. Um, uh, we are uh, like our, our engineers and, uh, and uh, what is it about? Well, it's about choosing the, the basin as a geographic entity, um, the territory, uh, the, the best uh, territory to manage the, the rivers and the groundwater that goes with it and the territory and all of the stakeholders that live on this territory. Uh, and yes, I, it, there is a dimension of, um, well, it's supposed to be sustainable, so it's and it, it is uh, sustainable when it, it is a sustainable uh, model of governance. Um, but it is also um, the right uh, way to approach um, hydro diplomacy at the basic level. Um, because what does this uh, propose? It proposes that all the stakeholders that uh, live on this territory are um, consulted and uh, come up with a plan, uh, an agreed upon plan to, to use and to sustain the base. So there's gonna be allocations and arbitrage with a level of public governance who has uh, the common good in mind. And of course, there are, of course, it's a very difficult practice. And of course, it doesn't go without uh, big fights. Um, but it is interesting. And, and it is uh, the underlying principles of uh, integrated water resources management, obviously, um, which brings together um, the industry, and uh, the, the, the agriculture and the cities. And, uh, and, and then you have uh, other stakeholders are trying to embody the, the voice of nature of the, the, the sustainability of the, the basin itself and how much water, water should be left so that nature can keep doing what it does so well and function in the long run. So yes, there is a, the, we, in French, we call it the grand cycle de l'eau. Um, and there's also the petit cycle. And the petit cycle, small cycle, is uh, at a smaller scale, obviously, uh, and dealing with, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the city level. I mean, how do we distribute and how do we uh, treat, purify the water, release it in nature, uh, etc. So um, it, it is very, it's extremely important to think 
those two dimensions together. Um, and uh, it's a goal, uh, but uh, yes, just to, to come back to your question, uh, the of government is extremely important. On those cycles, uh, well, let's take the example of France for a while. France has some rivers which are purely on a national territory. Loire, if I'm correct, the Seine, if I'm correct, the River Garonne. Uh, and as French people are known to be very peaceful, cooperative, people always happy at the moment. My friend, excuse me, French. That was as embarrassing. Long, as long as it is national, uh, the French hand. Take the, there's the Rhone, which is international, we'll get to the Rhone later, right. but take the Rhine, for instance. The Rhine is shared with, the, with Germany, with Netherlands. Switzerland, Netherlands, France. There, uh, the, and budget, because of course, the, the model, the so-called French model, can't be applied like this. But what's, what are the adjustments that we see there? So first, kind of step out the, the kind of canonic models on a river which is shared, and maybe a second question on how has this model within France evolved over time? The great cycle refers to nature, 1964, when the law was enacted, well, nature was, we had one perception of nature. Uh, 2023, we might have another perception of nature. So well, how did this concept evolve when it traveled and when it changed? Um, yeah, many good questions. Um, so of course, the concept of uh, IWRM uh, is now not very contested anymore. So it's very interesting to see that uh, uh, you have big international promoters of, uh, of this concept. That because they don't know it's a French concept. <laughs> well, I don't maybe, know. Maybe. Yes, and, no, and, may, and maybe maybe that's questionable too, but uh, at least for sure we haven't. So it is promoted. It, it is promoted. For sure. Yeah. Um, and it has influenced very much the European um, uh, water directives, um, and it is uh, at the, it is also a, a, a foundation for uh, many basin organizations. So I, I think you're you're pointing to 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 a reality, which is that um, uh, many, uh, for instance, I've been working a lot on transboundary uh, basins. And uh, we know that uh, many basins do not benefit yet of, uh, of some sort of agreement. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's very important that uh, the, the concept of uh, IWRM at a transboundary level also is adopted in uh, many, many, many basins. I mean, when I stopped working on this uh, five years ago, we had the figure that um, only 40% percent of transboundary basins uh, used, uh, do benefit from a basin agreement mm. at a transboundary level. So this figure, Christian is still, uh, Christian is still uh, valid, but it was 40%. And then out of this 40%, 80% of them were either obsolete or did not bring all of the countries around the table. Or it's, I mean, so. Um, so yes, it is, uh, there is a lot to be done uh, at the international level, for sure. One, one last question. You represent a community of practitioners, companies, not just companies, but also companies. Am I correct to say that some decades ago, the companies felt comfortable at the small cycle, the petit cycle, with bringing a value of their models, and that now they're broadly, increasingly broadening up to some sorts of contribution at the long cycle, and possibly inter- I mean, can they be hydro diplomats? Can the companies become part of this hydro diplomacy, which we, we, we think of being enlarged to, to prevent conflicts? Is, is the realization within the industry? I really do think so, yes. Um, just to, to uh, I'll go back to uh, an experience. Uh, the tasks that I was in charge for in my previous job working for uh, President Gorbachev's NGO, the Green Cross. Um, 
So we were advocating with uh, other partners, sometimes countries, sometimes uh, uh, NGOs like WWF, you know, um, trying to accompany the decision-making process of countries to ratify uh, the award, UN Water Courses Convention. And, uh, and of course, the economic uh, uh, actors uh, are extremely important. I mean, when countries are taking this decision, they want to hear that it's going, that it's going to have a very positive impact economically as well. And so we were actually, uh, you know, we were talking also to all sorts of uh, partners who could support uh, this advocacy. And, uh, we, and, and we did need, but it was still a new thing but we, we, we knew that we had to have the economic world on board to, uh, to actually make the decision happen. So it is, of course, extremely important. Yes, definitely. Thank you. Thank you, Marilo. And you, you gave an excellent introduction to, to, to Alisa. Alisa of course. Uh, because you mentioned uh, the Water Courses uh, Convention. So far, we've discussed about the different models, different variety of models, and this is what we're going to people with our uh, last three uh, speakers, uh, diversity of model, the necessity to have maybe some variants of hydro diplomacy, but maybe less hydro diplomatic models, lesser number of hydro diplomatic levels, models than the variety of national models. And of course, we live in one world, so one treaty, one for each issue, only one treaty. So Alicia, you're, you're from the Delft Institute, and uh, you, you've heard about variety of models. You yourself are a researcher, you work on variety of models. Still at the end, we, if we take, for instance, the water process treaty, we have to have one treaty. How can one treaty today, which is necessary, we need to have one common across the planet, yes. if at all we want platforms and exchange, how can one <laughs> in the world of today uh, handle uh, and evolve with, uh, uh, with a vari variety of, of, of models? And we have this UN conference uh, this year. Uh, the previous one was in 1977. Without making a whole excursus, what has changed and how all the treaties to change. I know you're not a lawyer, neither am I, so I feel sorry for my question, but you, you have the floor because the, the Delft Institute is very central in these issues. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to discuss it even without being a lawyer as the caveat. But I would say we certainly do have the UN Water Courses Convention that was established in 1997. It also was complemented by other conventions like the UNECE Water Convention, but of course that originally was quite regional and has since expanded to have a living secretariat. I think as you mentioned in the question itself, one of the biggest benefits of the convention is it gives us a shared language. It really creates these frameworks of different principles and different standards that we start to have that we can then use and take into different agreements that are specific for each basin. So to give an example, it's, it has great language about no significant harm, that we can agree that when basins cooperate, they shouldn't be causing harm downstream, but it's never actually defined what that harm means, what counts as significant. So then that's something that's able to be adapted into agreements that come out afterwards using that shared foundation of no significant harm from the convention. That being said, I mean, while it gives us these great principles that can be taken into regional specific agreements, it still is lacking things that we're talking about today. It doesn't set up a lot about vertical integration that Christian mentioned. How do we consider the implications that something in one country has on maybe more of those local conflict dynamics where things where conflicts can be a bit more violent, since we don't predominantly see any violent conflict on an international or interstate level, but that violent conflict happens more locally. So how does that get accounted for? How do we build those platforms and processes? That's not something that necessarily comes out of the UN Water Courses Convention. And I think that's one thing where this is a framework, but it still needs adaptation. And whether it's codified in agreements or just built into our river basin institutions and built into the processes we have, that's one way that we can make change from an agreement in the past. And sorry, I know you asked kind of two about 
what's the change in what we saw in 1970s versus what we see today? I think one thing that's quite striking for me this week is there's been a lot more discussion about inclusion on different perspectives, inclusion of different people, and reiterating this in cooperation at a transboundary scale. And that's something I certainly don't think we saw in the 70s, and certainly something we didn't see when a lot of agreements were negotiated. I think the, you know, Internet, the Boundary Waters Treaty, 1909, between the US and Canada is a prime example. It was negotiated between two countries. It didn't include any of the indigenous sovereign territories along the border that have water that flows through them as sovereign territories. So as we're seeing this change, I think we're starting to recognize that other voices need to be brought into the discussion. So how can we adapt our existing agreements so that we're not renegotiating the foundations, but that we are then adapting the agreements to be able to include other perspectives, other voices, other people who have rights to the water that just weren't recognized at the time when the original agreements were made. I know that deviates a bit, but I think that's one change we're seeing. And I think that is a challenge on how can we take the conventions that we've had and then expand that framework into something that's a bit more inclusive and a bit more prepared for a change no, in dynamics. I thank you for this answer because my assumption would have been that what had changed uh, was the resource. The resource has changed because the climate has changed. And and but your answer on, on society has changed. In a sense. Is, is it really important? That's, that also shows that rivers, especially shared rivers, are part of our societies. And maybe there's a recognition that the physical, the geophysical, the climate conditions have changed, but the societies have evolved, or at least our own perception of our societies have evolved. And uh, that rivers want to be treated not just as an object, uh, but maybe as a subject. Uh, acting into thought, into philosophical. No, I mean, I, I personally like it, and I think it touches on, you know, discussions of rights for rivers as a yes. new legal be. tool, but it's also acknowledging the cultural significance of those rivers. Yes, it is a way to empower people who speak for the river to then get greater equity, but it also is an acknowledgement of the cultural, spiritual connections that we have to water resources as well. But I will agree, I mean, I, we do have non-stationarity, we do have a changing climate, we do have different uses of water that don't necessarily meet the allocations we had when trees were made. So I, I think both changes are happening. And I think, you know, having these principles and conventions does give us at least a starting point to go from. Maybe a last question. Would you see in hydro diplomacy uh, the need for, when you said, you know, people who represent the river, can you elaborate on that? maybe and possibly back to the context of negotiations, because we've discussed in terms of actors, whether you have a river based in organizations or not exactly. Uh, in terms of negotiations and back to actual real negotiations, who yeah. are the actors uh, for an urgent need to be reintegrated in specific negotiations? Difficult question, but that's why we're here. That is a very difficult question. I will say in terms, when I said who speaks for the river, I was, I was thinking along the lines of the rights to the rivers and who is delegated as the voice of the river in the rights that are established, which varies from place to place where we've seen that movement happening. In some countries, anyone is able to speak on behalf of the river. In other countries, there are designated spokespeople. Uh, for instance, in Colombia, I believe on the Entrato, there are 12 individuals that are identified to speak for the river. Whereas in Ecuador, you have a much broader population that then can invoke the right to the river in different lawsuits. Uh, but that being said, in terms of negotiations, I think we by and large still see them happening between states and representatives of states, which is gets into how do we do these international agreements. But I think the delegations are starting to open up more. So those you know, still are informed by scientists, by civil society. And I think that's something we still need to be pushing for is a greater inclusion of voices. So I think in the negotiation of very specific treaties that are codified, sometimes that can be quite securitized and moved to the highest level of representations of countries. But I think even if we're not, I'm all for opening up those spaces, but if it's too difficult to open up those spaces, I think that's where we can get into how it actually gets managed on a river-based organization mm -hmm. level. How do we bother Idaho? Yeah, that process? would have been my, my question, in fact. Do you need to enter the kind of established existing spaces or? create alternative spaces and force the established spaces navigate and come to you know, like a convening power. Yeah, and I think we see stakeholders 
do force competing powers to come to them at times, not necessarily in the negotiation of the agreement, but in how the agreement gets interpreted or ratified. I mean, you brought up the case of the Rhine earlier. I believe there was an instance where Dutch farmers and Dutch water utilities came together and protested that chloride rules hadn't been ratified upstream. And so we do see civil society is able to really make an influence on what's happening between states. And as we create processes for that to happen peacefully, like through litigation or through representation on different bodies, then we're able to then include those voices more easily without having to elevate it through other potentially more, more violent means. I mean to say that in a negative framing, but it's just the more spaces we have for communication and dialogue, even if it's complex, complex that's managed through dialogue. But the sheer success of this conference is already telling. But people have missed it for 46 years, but a large array of very a variety of people who've missed it has, has increased many folks. Thank you, thank you for, so much for your, for your testimony. Clémence, Clémence Aubert, you work at Compagnie Nationale du Rhône. It's, uh, well, it's integrated water resource management uh, at its best because you, you're not just a river basin organization, you're a company on, on the river basin. T tell us more about uh, the model and how it evolves these days uh, as, as well. I'm sure you still have to uh, engage with people like Yonder. Yeah, um, so it, uh, the Compagnie Nationale du Rhône is a, a single operator uh, which, um, which activity uh, is inside this context of the uh, French um, management of water resource uh, at the scale of a basin. Um, so in the 1930s, um, when there was no uh, talk about uh, climate change, about uh, the pressure on the water resource, uh, two men uh, had this uh, pioneer vision uh, of um, um, a mission given to one single operator uh, to um, take care of three uh, missions, three um, uh, activities uh, that has to be taken by this single operator. Uh, these three missions are to produce electricity, um, to uh, develop river transport, navigation on the, on the road, and to irrigate farmland. And uh, these three missions uh, are, um, uh, has to be um, uh, managed together. There, there is no priority uh, for one mission or to another. So um, CNR has to manage these three um, missions uh, at the same time. Uh, later on, um, a fourth mission arrived, uh, which is uh, uh, to take care about um, uh, environment, about biodiversity, and also to um, manage um, uh, leisure activities uh, uh, around the river, cultural activities around the river. And so on, uh, the same company has to manage all this, um, but at the same time has to uh, speak with the uh, stakeholders uh, and has to um, discuss uh, about every project uh, uh, has to, we have to uh, ask the opinion of the stakeholders for every project which has an impact on the river. And um, uh, also something which is really important, um, uh, Christian uh, talked about um, the peace and uh, about the, uh, what, uh, what do we do uh, about these uh, benefits uh, from the river? Uh, talking about the Rhone, it's a sale of uh, electricity, um, which uh, gives uh, uh, money. And um, uh, the, the, the contract that uh, Siena has with state um, uh, allows him to um, uh, redistribute a part of the benefits uh, to the territories the uh, Rhone crosses. So it's uh, um, uh, a manner of uh, um, having all uh, together uh, to, to, to protect this resource because uh, everybody has a, a, a need to, um, to have an interest on it. So it's, uh, uh, I think it is a quite a resilient system and we saw it uh, uh, last summer um, when uh, 
in France there was a, a, this a huge uh, drought, and um, we saw that. Uh, um, I mean, the, the basins, the, the dams on the on the river uh, allowed the um, uh, height of the, the river uh, to um, to provide uh, water for the farmlands. Uh, it provides um, a high level of the water table, so that uh, the water uh, drink drink water drinking water was. Uh, um, provided and um, it also uh, was a, a good um, way for the navigation to, to continue. So I can testify that uh, uh, this uh, model is quite, uh, quite resilient. And navigation quite... was a problem on the right, obviously. Yeah. So I mean, it's not exactly the same situation, but yeah, on, the, on the road it continues. Yes, because we have a run of people. Done. From the sorry, I, I, I can't remember the, the, the word in, in English. Run of the river dams, that's it. And uh, so uh, it, it allowed the, the navigation to, to continue. You mentioned the fourth mission, which of course came later, as the world became aware of the show later. Uh, and, and but what is striking is that. The Compagnie Nationale du Rhône didn't just engage in two well conservation, preservation of what was there. No, you went into renaturation, that is to kind of rework the, some of the alter, alterations that had been done at late 19th century, the 20th. And we're back, to the, we're back to the question of Minister Fauci from, from, from Albania. But you know, this moment of thinking of what had happened, I would add to her question can we reverse it? And the CNR showed, in a way, somehow that. It can be reversed and not just preserving, conserving uh, what had become unwild and tamed, but kind of re naturating, re naturation. Can you just yeah. delve into that? Yeah, uh, this morning I heard in a side event that uh, uh, we can choose what we do from our heritage and uh, you are not obliged to keep everything. So, um, yeah, we have uh, in the in the room. Um, our uh, ancestors were not always wise. Uh, so we, we in at the beginning of the nineties, um, uh, the engineer decided to uh, put walls inside the river uh, to um, uh, curate, to auto curate uh, the, the river, uh, and it allowed uh, the navigation uh, at, at that time. And uh, so it was it was a great idea because. Uh, uh, the road could be uh, again uh, navigable. I don't know if it's correct, but you have the idea. And uh, so it, it was it, it was a good thing at that time. But uh, but then um, we realized that uh, the sediments um, uh, were stopped um, because of these walls inside the river. So. Um, it disconnected uh, the, the rivers from wetlands that uh, usually was uh, connected to the to the river, and um, so we engaged a huge program of um, restoration. We, we took these walls uh, of the of the river, and uh, we have we had a, a program of renaturation um, of all of these uh, of the canal and also of the old arms of the Rhone because the Rhone has a, is a river with uh, several arms and uh, so we, we engaged this, uh, this uh, huge program and uh, 120 kilometers were uh, restored um, for the last uh, 20 years and we still are doing so that. It started 20 years ago, not yeah. waiting for the hype of like, no, it's 20 years ago. Right? Yes, and it's still on and uh, it's uh, financed by this uh, sale of uh, electricity. Uh, it's a way of uh, distribution uh, in the territories. So it's not going to your shareholders. It's going back, not to, all. back to nature. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you for this testimony. Uh, Suvi, uh, you, you, we, we had an, an early conversation this morning, and I confess, uh, Suvi, you're from the diplomacy, obviously, 
And I confess to you something which I can well, display. I confess my admiration for, uh, for Finland. There hasn't been a conference in 46 years, but Finland has been consistent. And you've had a hydro diplomacy all, all throughout. Uh, and, and, and I think this is, this is important. Uh, we would want to hear a bit more about kind of the countries you engage with, the kind of activity you have with them. What is your perception of hydro diplomacy, how it's evolved over time, uh, and, and what are the outcomes? What are the well, successes. Thank you, Joel. And uh, uh, as a clarification, um, whether I'm or not I'm a hydro diplomat, it really depends on the definition. I'm a senior research scientist at the Finnish Environment Institute, but I collaborate very closely with the Finnish ministries and the Finnish approach to water diplomacy as we frame it within this context is really a multi-track approach. So you, you're right to clarify. You, you, you don't 100% stick to the canonic definition of hydro diplomat, but you perfectly stick to the definition we try to promote exactly. of hydro diplomat. Sure, sure, so sure. That's why we're happy to have Absolutely, it. and that's also aligned with our thing in that uh, definitely see what track one di diplomats are needed for the diplomacy, but uh, uh, the decision-making, the processes need to be aided by water experts. And that's one of the um, key building blocks of uh, Finnish water diplomacy approach at the moment. So we are bringing together the peace mediation community and the water expert community. And uh, with reference to Finland's long-standing approach, we haven't necessarily called it water diplomacy before, but Finland has played a key role uh, in the initiation of the both UN water conventions, and uh, I suppose uh, like the past five years have seen sort of a, like a re-emergence or like a profil prol proliferation of water diplomacy in the international fora. And now we are also framing our activities uh, from that perspective. Um, I'm also thinking about the uh, inter earlier interventions we've been uh, discussing water governance uh, uh, from a very uh, like a, a broad uh, approach uh, cross-sectoral collaboration, uh, collaboration uh, between various levels of governance um, and also conflicts related to water. Um, in my case and in my current capacity, we are really, really looking at ways to prevent conflicts, uh, to enhance peace and uh, as said, uh, how we approach the topic at the moment is that we bring together the diplomats, water experts, uh, we identify partners internationally who share our approach. Um, we really uh, uh, still uh, work for the uh, international water conventions for their uh, further uptake, uh, like their further implementation. But we think that there's also definitely a need for further capacity building, uh, including our own capacity, uh, but also experience sharing internationally. And uh, that's really the way forward. Two things. Uh, this track one, track two, where we understand that it's at the same time taking the scientists, the practitioners, the experts into the track one, and also having the track one diplomats mm -hmm. knowing more. Yes. So venturing into yes. the field of, of, of experts. Uh, well, it's having two different worlds take together. Mm -hmm. If I take the example of NDC, for instance, National Determined Contribution, Climate Change. On the one hand, we know that IPCC works triggered the whole thing. So science is at the core. Now, if you run the exercise, this is an exercise I, I run for myself at last moments, you know, you take a few random NDCs, very few refer to science. Not that many involve the scientific community. Uh, and, 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 and it's a preserve of diplomats. No. And it's a bit the same in, in hydro diplomacy. What, what are the resistances? What did you experience in the Finnish track? Uh, how can you share that with, uh, you know, I'm a scientist, I'm, I don't want to be depressed, but you know, the diplomats don't always, not always <laughs> listen to us. No? Sure. And maybe you're right, but <laughs> <laughs> what was your experience? Well, I see this. Uh, benefit uh, of being from a relatively small country 
that is still also like um, making its position in the international fora has been uh, like an advantage to us. We have very low silos. We have good cross-sectoral collaboration, low hierarchy. So that has helped. That has you know like a helpful starting point for us. Uh, it doesn't mean that we're our approach uh, of collaboration couldn't be replicated elsewhere. Maybe one can also show by example that this is possible. But um, yeah, I don't know if, uh, again, we come to the point that water uh, issues, water questions are always very context dependent and it really goes back to respecting those differences as well. My second question is how do you share that internationally? experiments you have you've had internally to Finland how do you I mean you, you've touched that upon again but are there some countries specific specifically which you can name uh, uh, this kind of hydro diplomacy of uh, of Finland has triggered to maybe not modern not the Finnish modern like French school or Finnish school but how have you con how would you assess the capacity Finland has had to contribute uh, this model into other countries or into regions of, of bringing different uh, tracks. From yeah. um, I think we're still in a process of doing that. And I think there are two distinct things, whether how we have all, like organized ourselves internally, like how, whether that can be taken elsewhere or whether the things we are working for, where they can be like applied and when it comes to the latter it's really uh, about working together and i think for example the UNEC water convention that alisa also referred to is a good example of uh, like a set of principles a framework that finland has indeed uh, played uh, quite a key role in and now we are taking that forward to different contexts and uh, i think the number of uh, countries that have uh, announced they are uh, acceding to the convention during this very conference is also a very good example of that effort. We've had a very rich conversation. It's been late already and we have some drinks waiting for us. Uh, without taking too much time, I would want to have a kind of quick round of applause. Usually in those type of panels, we give a one minute to each speaker to, to reinforce their key points and etc. I would want a different exercise, which is don't bring your key points, but um, bring the key point you've learned from someone else from the panel, from the conversation, something you've maybe discovered or understood a different way or that opens a new question. With Michel who used to say that intellectual work is to endeavor to think differently than what you were thinking. So are you thinking differently uh, now compared to one half hour ago? Uh, Eric, I know you're passionate about learning. Uh, yeah, the point is, what do you think differently now? Uh, I don't know, but the point is diplomacy is not a problem uh, only uh, how to prevent conflict between different nations, but more and more, it's a method to prevent conflict within one country, within one country. And the point is now, our democracy will face uh, two more challenges. First one, to uh, learn how to share a very essential uh, resource and with uh, more and more scarcity. That's the first point. The other point is to share between uh, short run and long run. If you empty a uh, phreatic reservoir, well, well you'll be uh, quite well during two or three years and then afterwards. One of the points of the democracy is being quite able to integrate uh, long run uh, values at the point. And this is quite, quite stern, I think. No. So, so uh, well, uh, and in, uh, in a democracy like France, which is uh, quite ill, well, uh, the, the, the coming month will be quite stern. Well, uh, so, uh, 
rendezvous in Paris. <laughs> <laughs> Has this panel made you pessimistic or? No, I am realist. Okay. okay. In spite of being economist. <laughs> An economist was realist. That's, uh, interesting. <laughs> uh, who wants to venture about what you've learned, gathered, and puzzled or? I don't know. Yeah, sure. No, I feel uh, positive, I would say. Uh, I think this conference, of course, it's, it's uh, hard to understand it. 50 years or almost 50 years for it to um, take place again. Um, but um, there, are, there are reasons to be optimistic because I think uh, there is the level of maturity among uh, the community, the water community, the decision makers has risen. And also as uh, the Finnish um, Matt was saying, I forgot your name. Uh, there are good reasons to, do, to be optimistic too with the uh, new ratifications of this convention. It's kind of a counter trend to what we hear a lot. We hear a lot about the, uh, the, the risk of conflicts, but there is a counter dynamic, which is uh, actually uh, a more cooperation and more awareness of the risk of not cooperating. And uh, that's positive trend. Mr. Maybe as a, as a follow-up, um, I think I'll go back to the inclusion point that you mentioned. And I think this is indeed a very interesting change of paradigm. It's not only about hydrological or climate data, but also about hydropolitical data, society. And But I think it's also important not to say that it's a black and white story, to say that uh, more inclusion is necessarily always good. And I think we have also to be ready for more messy processes mm. for processes that will take more time uh, because if you want to listen to everybody well it takes time uh, and that, that means also that we need to be better equipped and here to come back to your point eric i need the uh, hydro diplomacy can become a method uh, to, to 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 lead those processes with better actors i mean i i completely under agree here i think it's setting up a lot more dialogue a lot more time a lot more effort to understand each other and both consensus. But maybe in terms of talking about other actors coming into the picture, I had not really thought about the role of businesses, that could, what they could play in transboundary agreements and supporting water diplomacy. And I think even the minister gave a great example of Patagonia being part of the EO Safari mm -hmm. and then how it might expand to Greece. And so I think I don't have a good takeaway from it, but I think it's a really interesting thing to look, look at and to assess how we're gonna to start to address this in the future. Also, especially as we see a lot of the private sector becoming more socially and environmentally conscious. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. Um, um, I think that um, the company has a, a huge role, but um, I think that the um, public uh, state uh, or the local authorities uh, are uh, really important. They have to, to give the rules and um, they have to give the rules and they have to uh, listen to the local communities. And it's what I uh, uh, noticed in your uh, uh, speech is uh, um, the decisions that are made at a high level, uh, how uh, what impact do they have on the local people who live uh, from the, the, the rivers, from the, the water? And um, it's, uh, it's uh, a big issue. And uh, we learn to, um, to, to work all together, but uh, it's, it's, um, it's quite difficult. Uh, and uh, but the, it is difficult because the climate change will uh, um, accelerate uh, these uh, discussions to, to be achieved. Great. Uh, I'm going to just second what Christian and Alyssa mentioned about the multi stakeholder collaboration, like increased inclusion. I think that's uh, absolutely needed. And having followed international water forum events for the past 10 years, I think there has been an evolution in that regard. 
which is very much uh, needed and welcome. And there's also evolution in the like those additional sort of additional actors understanding of the water space that it is indeed quite complex. We need to really also appreciate um, like each other's uh, viewpoints, understanding, expertise, and really bring the science to the policy processes as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe if I'm allowed to uh, use my, my use my role of a chair and to say my own realization, I must say that over the years, like I'm sorry, sure, but 30 years ago, I, I used to discover a great river, which was the Senegal River, uh, and then try to work on water. And I, I got drawn into water. Water, re I realized, is a very huge, complex issue. So I can't but I'm all And recently, uh, largely thanks to Eric, but also to the interactions with you people, uh, I, I got reassured by what I would call the company of rivers. Water is, remains complex. Rivers are an actionable uh, system. They're an actionable ecosystem in terms of nature. They're an actionable course in terms of politics. Some are more tricky than others, but uh, I, I've discovered uh, the brotherhood, the sisterhood of the company of rivers. And I want to thank all of you for having shared your experience on this company of rivers. And I wish long life to our little small company of rivers. And uh, and rendezvous in Tirana. And rendezvous in Tirana and in Finland. <laughs> <laughs>